question. So, go ahead. You're still muted. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, before I start, is there any question from uh, yesterday's uh, lecture? Um, okay, so if not, I do want to clarify one uh, question. I think someone asked a question here to say that um, when we do double copy, whether we care about the ACU and gate structure uh, in young males. And the answer is no. Um, but I don't think um, I understood the question uh, back then. But maybe the question is that, you know, obviously, when we talk about gauge theory, the choice of ACU and gauge um, group is very important. You have different like phases or dynamics depends on um, different values at end, for example. But when we do double copy, we specifically um, make it a way that um, the color factor, we only care about Jacobi. And um, when we go to loop level, um, it's really the loop integrand that we double copy. On the hand, the actual physical amplitude, the one where we integrate over this integrand, we actually don't have a good double copy how to relate like different gauge theory to gravity. And these are the objects because these are physical amplitudes. These are objects that really cares about different SU and um, the gauge group structure. But for the double copy on formulation, we only talk about this integrand and they're relatively insensitive to this uh, SU and gauge group structure. Okay, so just one thing I want to clarify for um, um, from the, the lecture yesterday. But today I'll focus on more of shell physics on effective field theory. So the idea behind effective field theory is that whenever there's a hierarchy of scales, namely there's a separation between UV and IR, this usually leads to simpler um, degrees of freedom and also on simpler description. By this, I mean, for example, instead of solving the full Einstein equation, we have uh, effective potential, then we can simply use uh, classical mechanics. And also once we parameterize things in the infrared, um, it also characterizes the universal dynamics. It's not insensitive to the details of the UV as long as you have the same IR parameters. So a typical example, a standard textbook example is say, if I consider, um, say I have a full Fermi interaction mediated by some heavy W or um, Z boson. And uh, we can integrate out this uh, heavy intermediate boson and replace this with a local effective operator. But you can see that um, this typical example if you think about the context we're interested, we're interested in gravitational binary. So the immediate question is, what are the heavy or UV degrees of freedom that we want to integrate at? Because the obvious heavy things like black holes, are they obviously, they still exist in the IR and we definitely do want to keep this black hole. So this will be one of the uh, main things I want to explain that uh, what degrees of freedom we want to integrate out when we use this gravitational um, this EFT for gravitational um, binary. Okay, so let me first discuss on the relevant scales uh, for gravitational binary. Okay, so consider this on uh, two black holes or neutron stars. We have the relative distance between them. Or in the case of scattering, these are set by the impaired parameter B. And if we use moment and space, this is conjugate T1 over Q in moment and space. We also have the internal size of the black hole given by roughly by the Schwarzschild radius, which is roughly G times M, where M is the mass scale. And uh, there's another important parameter, which is the velocity. This is not a scale, it's just um, a dimension that's um, parameter, but uh, it's an important um, parameter that we can use. So we can consider how to make uh, corrections um, while, the, while the hierarchy of scales are in this problem. So there will be the one relevant for classical physics. 
The first one is coming from the GR or finite size correction. So in this context, we're only interested in um, in spiral regime. That means that the internal size of the black hole is much smaller than the relative distance. And if you use the fact that this is roughly of order GM, then we see that this ratio is given by GM over R. That's why I call it also a GR or finite size correction. And want to consider um, this being smaller than one and want to add this correction systematically. Another correction coming from velocity, which is of order V squared, and this is also smaller than one. So in the case of scattering, these two are really two separate um, small parameters. And you can even consider a case where the gravity is weak, but the scatterings are relativistic. But for the bound state system, because of uh, V real theorem, um, this V squared and uh, G and over R, they of the same order. So you can't really um, talk about the velocity being a very visible while these two objects are still far apart. Okay, so these are the classical um, hierarchy of scales that we want to consider. Here's another big hierarchy of scale, which has to do with quantum physics. This coming from the ratio of um, de Broglie wavelengths over any microscopic scale and pick R. And the de Broglie wavelengths scale as h bar over m. This is r. So this one um, is given by h bar over m r. So we can write as um, h bar times q over m. Or if you use the fact that this angular momentum is given roughly by n v r, then modulo this uh, small v is also given by one over j. So you can see that here that the classical effect, classical limit correspond to large angular momentum, which is what we learned in quantum mechanics. So to keep this classical effect, that means that we only want to keep a leading order in the Q over M or one over J. So these are much smaller than one. Okay, so now, um, let me discuss some the relevant degrees of freedom. So we have um, two objects, the um, black hole or neutron star, the matter and gravity. So the black hole neutron star naively looks like a giant stuff of object um, that this uh, can be quite arbitrary. But as long as somewhere in the in-spiral regime, they're relatively far apart and you can treat them as point particle. So mechanically, that means that for this uh, point particle action, we can simply describe this by a wall line. And of course, when we reduce um, this um, re um, usual black hole or neutron star to a point particle, this could have additional structure coming from the fact that um, we have uh, spin or tidal effect uh, when we integrate out on um, these uh, details of uh, this uh, microscopic object. And the beauty of uh, effective field theory is that we can include this effect systematically in the EFT language. This will be just some higher dimensional operators. So for example, for the tidal effect, the usual, we can describe this by adding a, a um, higher dimensional operator coupled with some uh, Riemann square. And um, sometimes this coefficient is also called the love number. Because we're doing quantum field theory, so we're probably more used to um, describing things in terms of scalar field. So for example, if I look at leading um, this uh, wall line, we can describe this by using a uh, scalar field. So this is d for x. F the connected term minus one square plus square. But you can see that there's one important difference uh, here. So in this uh, second context form, when we deal with uh, quantum uh, field theory, we will have antiparticles here. So 
So the degrees of freedom we want to keep is that we want to remove these antiparticles because we don't have anti-black hole um, for um, the classical physics. Okay, so how do we do that? So we can actually control that by looking at the gravity sector. So in order to slide these um, objects into the antiparticles, that means the graviton, they also have to have very high energy in order to excite, say, a black hole into anti-black hole. So that means the scale of the graviton moment at L will be of order N. And this is also sometimes called hard graviton. So we can avoid this anti-particle by avoiding, say, all the graviton to have any hard scale. So we can control um, the, the, the states we don't want to have by looking at graviton interaction with some relatively weak momentum. So if we focus on the um, orbital interaction of uh, this binary, so remember that um, the distance is of order r, which is um, one over q, and this will be roughly the wavelengths of my um, graviton. So my graviton momentum L, we have the energy and swing momentum, so for the so-called potential, we have the wavelengths of order Q, say the momentum of, of their Q. But if you consider a typical um, bound state, if you look at the matter, the energy and C momentum is of order mv squared and v. So that means the energy mediated by um, the graviton here should be also rapidly suppressed in velocity. So that's why for the, the potential region, um, this graph down would have this characteristic scale for energy and momentum. So we can look at um, this at a larger scale. So if we look at a scale of uh, R of um, the scale as R over V or the, um, the stream momentum of the scale V times Q. So this is like a slowly Bearing background, and this will be the scale relevant for radiation. So, um, in the energy, uh, because these are onshore radiation, the energy and um, the 3D momentum would have the same scale. So, that's also a scale for the energy. So, you can see that uh, differently, say that differently by saying, okay, the graviton energy is sourced by the binding energy, and therefore the order VQ. So these are the um, relevant scales if we consider, say, a non relativistic system. But if we consider, say, a relativistic scattering, then it's actually more convenient to combine these and use the so-called uh, soft uh, scaling, which is just of, the, of order Q and Q. And this will be um, suitable if you consider relativistic scattering. Any questions so far? Okay, so now uh, with some of this scale in mind, we can discuss the preparation a, for a classical object. So consider the usual potential. We have a leading on uh, Newtonian term. And now we see that the question is coming either from velocity or coming from GR or finite size effect. So there are two popular um, perturbation scheme. One is that if we consider the bound state, the V squared and uh, GM over R you know, of um, the same scale. So if we do perturbation in this parameter, this is so-called post-Newtonian region or PN. And um, if you're interested in scattering, it's more natural to do just some quantum field theory. So we'll just do perturbation in G, but keep all this in velocity. And this is sometimes called the post minkowskian regime. But it's really just a perturbation theory in non-usual particle physics. So for a potential, uh, we can have the following. We can have things linear in G and uh, with 
uh, velocity correction. And since cosine order g squared, we saw velocity correction or gq, for example. So each vertical term corresponds to the same order in post Newtonian um, perturbation. So each vertical column here corresponds to the same order in Pn. And uh, each uh, horizontal row, oops. They're of all the same order in G, and therefore they correspond to the so called one, oh, 1 pm, 2 pm, or 3 pm. So, for example, 1 pm is just the, what we call tree level, and 2 pm is like one loop, et cetera. Okay. Now, so let me just to summarize. Um, the different scale and uh, the degrees of freedom that we have. So we have, again, black hole with neutron star and gravity. So we have different degrees of freedom if uh, we look at different scales. So if we go to the quantum wavelengths, this is of order um, Qn over, oops, sorry of order h bar over m, then these are really just uh, quantum state. And the corresponding graph down will be a so-called hard graph down of order m. So if you zoom out to the microscopic scale, like this Russia radius, then uh, this black hole neutron star just look like, say, a finite size object. And in this case, the gravity we have to use the standard Einstein equation. If we zoom out to the orbital scale, then this uh, black hole looks like a point particle. And if we consider a binary of them, a binary uh, system. And uh, in this case, the interaction uh, through gravity is the so-called potential graviton. Um, L scale is VQ comma Q the energy is relatively suppressed. If we keep zooming out to a scale like this uh, over V, then we can view this um, binary system, view them as a single body again, and uh, with some internal structure, for example, the quadruple moment, and this will be a source for the um, gravitational wave. And the gravity in this case will be given by the radiation of order VQ comma VQ. Of course, if you consider relativistic scattering, then again, this is uh, given by the soft of order Q comma Q. So one important thing is that we want to know that what are the symmetries that we keep um, when we reduce to different scale. So when we focus on this potential, we commit to a non-relativistic frame. So in this case, we lose the boost um, symmetry, but we still have the rotational symmetry the SO3 spatial rotation. So we lose boost. But of course, if we consider relativistic scattering, then we have the full Lorentz invariance. So the idea here, we can ask why is M2 useful? M2 is useful because on the typical uh, formulation of potential, we don't have the full uh, Lorentz invariance. But if we use the relativistic amplitude, then we can have the clean structure coming from the Lorentz invariance. So the idea is we want to use this uh, Lorentz invariance on scattering and help us to understand um, this um, GR potential and give us insight for this um, two body problem. Okay, um, any questions so far? So now let me give, me give you more details about um, off-shell effective field theory. This is so-called uh, NRGR 
non-relativistic general relativity um, by Goldberger and Don Rostin. Okay, so the idea is very simple. So I have the full action given by the uh, wall lines of the uh, binary. And the gravity is described by the Einstein Hilbert action. So the graviton, we can split into different momentum modes. We have the background modes coming from radiation. And we have this as the potential uh, graph down with different momentum scaling. So say in this way, then the effective potential if, or the effective action, yes. is simply given by a pass integral over this sum um, potential um, graph down. So we integrate out this sum um, potential graph down and that simply give us the effective action. So let me give you a tool example. So let me consider instead of gravity, just linearize uh, delta. Okay, so in this case, the action is given again by the wall line. And we want the wall line to couple with the delta. So we have the coupling constant and this phi being the um, delta. And this delta is mass s and we linearize that such that the only relevant action is the kinetic part. So let me separate this into the wall line. Just the, um, the delta part of the action. And let me write the um, coupling to the matter is the source J. So now by comparing these two, this uh, source J is simply a delta function uh, source at the wall line of the particle. And then we integrate out, so integrate over um, the pop time of um, the particle. And let me put the coupling constant in front. So this will be square root G. Okay. So now the effective action is simply given by the log of the partition function, which is um, just given by um, integrating out this um, delta with this action. So this um, pass integral now becomes very simple because in this simple example, you can see that this is a Gaussian theory. So therefore this um, pass integral is simply given by um, this simple expression. So graphically, that means that I have um, this um, effective action just some quadratic in the uh, source J. I have uh, Jx and Jy, and I'm just integrating over and with this D in the propagator. This D is the propagator in position space. Okay, so now um, we simply plug in this, um, uh, the current, and we use the fact that this um, propagator in movement space is given by um, this expression. Okay. And now, um, because um, these uh, sources, their delta function, so they'll simply localize this uh, d4x, d4y, and we have um, the additional integration of a proper time. And for simplicity, let me just pick the um, part time being the coordinate time. So now this expression reduced to the following. Oops. So if I consider um, these two sources coming from particle one and two, so let me put so like this, this, coming from particle one and two, 
then the coupling is proportional to G and one and two. And um, I have to prefactor one half, or probably be sloppy about factors of uh, half and twice, et cetera. And uh, we have the two times coming from these two sources, T1, T2. And uh, we have this, um, this uh, D4K integral coming from the propagator. So this will be D3K, then it's split into um, this 3D part and the energy part. We have this um, exponential omega t1 minus t2 and the spatial part. And finally, this um, propagator for the um, theta. Let me make it slightly better by moving stuff around. Okay, any question? So now, um, how do we deal with that? So this um, propagator is really like green function. And normally this will be something on local in time. But a critical part is that if we focus on this K um, being the so-called um, potential, then remember that it has a relative scaling, um, VQ comma Q. So that means we can expand this uh, propagator and toss all the energy part into the numerator. So now if I just focus on the first part, which only depends on spatial moment and case square, now you can see that it doesn't count energy. So on this part, simply become a delta function in T1, T2. And on this one over K square, um, is simply a full transform um, to the relative distance X1 minus X2. So if I use this uh, expansion, then um, the result is uh, proportional to, instead of just having two times T1, T2, because of this delta function, oops, this delta function, we have a single time and then we just use dt and it's proportional to g and one and two. And on this one over k square, um, after this uh, Fourier transform, uh, it's conjugate to uh, one over r, okay? And of course we have additional terms here and this omega square, they simply turn into um, the derivative acting on these delta functions. And if you use integration by part, these uh, derivatives will hit on um, this uh, position x1, x2 again. So that turned into velocity. So we can see that um, the velocity correction coming from this term give us things like v1 dot v2, or um, another possible term is v1 dot r, v2 dot r. We need to have r squared for dimensional analysis. So this will be a correction of order v squared coming from um, this uh, graph town, the theory town propagator. Okay, so what is this object? So recall that in the very beginning, these are simply the effective action by integrating out um, this uh, uh, internal theory so this is the effective action describing two black holes. So this is the classical on the Grangian with uh, the position x12 of t and uh, the velocity at time t. So that's how we obtain the effective um, the classical um, action by integrating out the theta. And it's also very similar. Uh, we just um, need to replace uh, this interaction with Einstein Hilbert action, and then we'll get the effective potential for gravity. So there are several remarks I want to um, make here. 
The first thing is that I posed a question in the very beginning, what are the scales we want to integrate out when we consider this uh, gravitational EFD? So you can see that here, the EV is really short um, time scale um, interaction by graviton or diagram. That's why the final result we have uh, after we integrate out this uh, short time scale uh, interaction, the potential is really instant Genius, which is a direct consequence coming from the fact that we use the potential being dominated by the spatial part and all energy is upstairs. And therefore when you do Fourier transform, it becomes a delta function, which localizes the two time of the sources. Okay. And the second thing is that this effective potential is uh, manifestly classical. This is in contrast to the effective action, the partition function Z, which is exponential of EI as effective. And if I restore H bar, then you see this has a one of H bar here. And now diagrammatically, this is just given by um, this type of diagram. So when we expand this partition function, we'll get one plus I as over H bar plus the square term, et cetera. And you can see that um, for the level of the action, the classical just means the leading one, the leading one by H bar term. But once we talk about this partition function, um, this uh, H bar extension becomes more subtle because this is obviously some artifact from this exponentiation of the classical action. And this is indeed uh, very similar to the case of Amptu. And so one important part is how to clean up this iteration structure in the M2 and extract the classical information. When this traditional of show EFT, this um, classical um, behavior is manifest. So the third point is that um, when we consider um, this uh, effective action, this is really of show because these, um, the wall line, the X of D, they're really arbitrary. I haven't specified anything about this uh, matter dynamics. Namely, they can either be other um, scattering or they can be uh, a bounce state. And as you can see, this is really useful because we can now use this effective action to calculate this um, bounce state dynamics and bypass the uh, Einstein equation. And fourth, that um, we consider a similar case of Linwright's um, delta interaction. But once you add on self interaction, it's still very similar that this effective action is given by this um, connected diagram. So this is diagram we have for Gaussian theory. If we add self interaction among the delta, then we just have this type of diagram. And uh, if the wall line couple with two delta, then we have this type of diagram. So you can see that here, even though this diagram looks like loops, um, but they are not loops. In particular, all these uh, lines, they are cut, these loops are being cut open. So these loops are really just a uh, phase-based integral over all possible uh, sources. And these are just the connected diagram. Okay, so the last comment is that we can see that here that velocity uh, correction coming at two places. It comes from the one of the case square propagator where we is uh, trivially fixed by the Lorentz invariant structure. And um, another place where we get velocity correction is uh, from non trivial vertices. Where in this case, in this uh, simple toy example, we don't have uh, vertices, non-trivial vertices, um, but say in the case of GR, you'll get velocity regression from both of them. Okay, so um, these are the features of this offshore effective field theory. And as you can see that it's um, quite useful because it's already classical. Also, you can use that for bound state dynamics.
the downside is that this velocity correction is actually um, not so uh, straightforward to calculate. And uh, even for this uh, simple V square correction, you have to do a little bit of work, not too much. So the question is, uh, can we improve this? And as I said in the beginning, that um, the MQ is being really useful. Say if I consider the 222 scattering MQ, say for this uh, the same process that here, we have the one over T and some numerator that depends on the outpass. But if you compare with the potential that we just found, say the order V square correction, where do you have um, two possible uh, structures that can appear? One R, V two R. For all um, this order V square correction. The nice thing about um, the Lorentz invariance from scattering M2 is that this is um, only given by a single parameter S where when you do an offshore action, you can have all uh, these two um, type of structures. And this is not surprising because ultimately this is just an offshore um, potential and it's subject to coordinate transformation that uh, this potential will also change. So it's not surprising that um, it looks more complicated. So the goal here is really that we want to combine the simplicity um, in this um, relativistic scattering M2 and try to improve um, this um, predictive structure uh, for this um, bound state potential. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, cool. So, um, because we want to discuss now move on to onshore physics, let me first set up on the kinematics uh, for this problem. So we want to consider a 2 to 2 scattering of on two scalar, one, P2, P3, P4. And as a four point process, we have the usual Mendel stand on P and S. So if I give this uh, Q as a mountain transfer, then T is given by Q square and S is given by P1 plus P2 square. But in this uh, gravitational wave context, um, we usually prefer to use a number variable, um, sometimes called sigma or gamma, which is defined as p one p two over n one n two. So this replaces on um, the s minus n that we usually use in QFT. So if you look at the onshore condition um, for this, um, so these two are of the same masses, so. P1 squared equal to P4 squared equal to P1 squared, P2 squared. So the onshore condition gives us the following. So P1 dot Q is uh, half Q squared, and P2 dot Q is um, minus half Q squared. So another set of uh, variables that people usually use um, is the following. So we want to trivialize on um, this um, onshore condition here. So sometimes people use this as P1 bar um, plus half Q, or this is P2 bar minus half Q, such that in this um, variable, P1 dot Q is zero, and um, P2 dot P2 bar dot Q is zero. And um, you will see that this set of variable is more useful because when you do integration, uh, things are immediately decoupled. And when we discuss potential, we usually restrict to uh, the central mass frame. And uh, in the central mass frame, um, the kinematics, the stream momentum, have uh, this back-to-back um, -back scattering. So P1 is really on E1, on comma, on P, and P2 is E2 minus P. And crucially, the momentum transfer Q here is purely spatial. That means that the incoming energy and outgoing is the same for individual um, particle one and two. And in this case, of course, the T is then given by minus Q squared. Okay, so this is just setting up some basic kinematics for the problem. And now I want to discuss about the onshell effective field theory. 
Okay, so how are we gonna do that? So again, we will split the uh, action into the kinematics part plus on uh, the interaction. So previously we used the wall line formation, but um, if we want to do on uh, quantum field theory, we prefer to keep things as some uh, second context form. So the kinetic, uh, kinetic term is simply given by um, the sum of a particle one and two and uh, this structure. Okay. Mm. And integrate over um, D4K. Okay, so what is this connected term? You should view this A and A degree and A just like the creation and ionization operator. And um, this structure here uh, demands that the energy satisfy this uh, dispersion relation. Another important fact is that we only have um, linear order in this time derivative. This is in contrast to the usual quadratic um, kinetic term, because by keeping this uh, time derivative to be linear, we also avoid the antiparticle by construction. So here, they go here. And uh, one uh, technical comment is that if you compare on this kinetic term with the usual scalar um, field, you'll see that the one particle state is differed by minimization um, square root to minus the energy. So that means that if I consider a four point MQ, the E of T MQ given here, if you consider the usual Q of T MQ, you should um, add another for E1, E2. Um, coming from this uh, normalization factor for each particle. So it's just a normalization. Okay, so now we have the connected term describing like um, the wall line in the second quantization uh, language. What about the interaction? In, in particular, we know that the interaction we want to fit here in this effective field theory is the potential. So how do we incorporate potential in this picture? So the potential is like the following. We have um, two incoming particles in the center mass frame K minus K and outgoing K prime minus K prime. And they're interacting through this potential. So the potential really behaves like a Wilson coefficient. In particular, um, here we have E4K1, oops. We have the potential here, and I call this as a Wilson coefficient because this operator is given by this uh, final state and the initial state. And um, in the EFT, the classical potential or the usual potential is viewed as a Wilson coefficient for this operator the full part of the operator. Okay, so that's the um, EFT that we're gonna use. So there are several um, features. The first thing is that importantly, uh, we pick the, this uh, DT only appear here. So if we consider the Hamptonian, which is just the Legendre transformation um, of um, from the Lagrangian, the conjugate momentum um, is um, simply given by a dagger because crucially dt on d appears here. So when we convert this Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian, it is simply given by the kinetic term a dagger on square root on k square plus m square a integrate over k plus this potential a dagger a dagger a a. Let me um neglect the, this um the tables. So therefore that um, if we sandwich on this uh, Hamiltonian with some uh, two particle states, say K prime minus K prime, Hamiltonian K minus K, then this really give us the classical um, Hamiltonian. 
So this is um, just a technical remark. So before we see that the effective um, action maps to the Lagrangian, um, and in this formulation, we refer to maps into the canonical uh, Hamiltonian in terms of position and uniformity. Okay, so now um, you can parameterize this potential um, as a following. It's a function of um, this uh, incoming and outgoing momentum k and k part. Okay, and um, for linear order in G, and if we define the momentum transfer as um, k minus k prime, then we know at order G, the potential behaves like one over Q squared. So we have a, um, then the, the dynamics is given by a coefficient C1 uh, as a function of K squared. And we have G squared for the from the Q. And the, this uh, structure is dictated by classical um, expansion. And then we have to multiply the leading term by G over G and Q. So the coefficient is given by a prompt try that as a C2, et cetera. And um, for the convenience of uh, mapping this um, to the Christian space, let me just add some minimization factor, such that when I do a Fourier transform on this uh, conjugate momentum Q, they become like G over R on C1 of K squared plus G squared. R square, C2 of P square, et cetera. So, okay, now we have the this potential. And so far, I haven't said anything about the underlying dynamics. This could be a gravity theory or um, some other theory. So how do we fix um, this potential? The idea is to use the so-called EFT matching. So we know that there's a lot of simplicity in this, um, the unshell amplitude from the full theory. And um, we want to write down this um, potential and we want to calculate the corresponding EFT amplitude. And we can fix this um, EFT potential simply by uh, matching um, this observable. And um, just a technical part that remember we have this normalization. And by doing so, we can relay the simplicity in unshell amplitude and map that to a the offshore um, potential. And um, the reason this is more useful is that um, from the top-down approach, when we do the integrating out of the um, graph down before, we don't really have it, we don't really know what the good choices of coordinate or the choice of gauge. But from this um, bottom up approach, when we match the physical amplitude, um, we directly use the simplicity in this uh, unshell spectrum amplitude. Um, so just to give a simple um, tree level example, so um, to compute this um, EFT amplitude, we can simply use some uh, family diagram. And the family rules is given by the following. So if I have um, this particle with energy E on 10K, and this is the propagator for this uh, material particle. And uh, the only interaction in this EFT is that we have this uh, full particle to do two uh, interaction fixed by the uh, potential. So for order G, um, this is relatively simple, that the only farm diagram we have is simply this one, and um, the EFT amplitude is uh, minus V. And if we use the parameterization we have earlier, this is simply given by this. Okay, so this is EFT amplitude. And um, so from the lecture last week, um, we also calculate the actual full theory amplitude. And um, 
because we want to match this of order one over Q square. So this is given by this on T channel change and the four series amplitude have the, this uh, result. Same by G, in one square, two square, two sigma square minus one. And um, just to remind you, sigma is defined as P1 dot P2 over M1 M2. So now the potential um, is given by this coefficient C1, which is simply minus M1 square M2 square over um, E1 E2 to sigma square minus one. And um, this E1 E2 downstairs is coming from this normalization. So we can take the limit where if um, the momentum is zero, what is so-called stacked limit. Then this uh, variable sigma P1, P2 over M1, M2 is simply one because we only get the mass term um, here. So you can see that this um, coefficient C1 simply reduced to minus M1, M2. So say so in other words, the potential, we just recover the Newtonian physics G M1, M2 over R. Okay, so what's the useful thing about um, this EFT matching? So now you can see that from the answer M2, it only depends on this uh, relativistic variable sigma, which we sums order in dot C. And now by doing this matching, we simply have um, this coefficient also mapped to order in dot C. But if we compare it with the previous offshore EFT that we have, even though that gives us a lot of intuition, but to get this order V square question, where do you have to do some work to um, you know, take all these derivative, et cetera, and get some result. But now using this EFT matching, we really get all the embossy um, at once. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so I see that I still have some sort of time. So um, maybe I'll just um, discuss about classical counting. So recall that the classical um, expansion is that the quantum effect is given by Q over M. So when we deal with some of the quantum scattering M2, we want to count what are the things they are quantum and want to describe them as soon as possible. So we have the following rule uh, for this, um, um, the, what we call Q counting, counting the order Q from this soft graph now. So for a vertex like this, uh, with any number of graph down, because this one coupled with the matter and gravity is a two to theory. So the vertex is really given by the P square um, of order P square coming from the matter. So in terms of the um, graph down momentum, the leading order is only by, given by order one. On the other hand, if you consider a graph down self interaction, um, like this uh, QB vertex, again, the gravity is a two derivative theory. So, but um, unlike the, this um, coupling to the matter, um, this graphton, the only available momentum is graphton momentum. So this point is given by order Q squared. So these are counting for the vertices. Um, for the propagator, for a matter propagator, so imagine if I have some graph time exchange and say then call this L and this is P. The propagator is given by this one, but the leading term actually cancel. So that's the um, behavior we have for a typical matter propagator. And um, if you count this L being of order Q on the graph time, this is of order one over Q. And uh, likewise, if you consider a graphton propagator, this is just some um, obviously one of the order k square. And in this counting, I basically count all the graphton momentum of order q. Okay, so 
if we have this counting, um, then later on when we discuss uh, one loop, so for example, okay, so I should start with some tree level again. So for tree level, the potential we expect is of order G over Q square. And you can see that you agree with some of this T channel exchange that we've been using over and over. So the matter propagate, the matter, these two matter vertices here gives me order one. And I have one graviton propagator, which gives me one over on order Q squared, according to the rules that I just described. And um, if we go to one loop, for example, consider this uh, triangle diagram. We have D4L on the loop integration measure, and uh, all the vertices here uh, are on the matter. So here all one. But we have um, two graviton propagators, each of them is one over Q square, and uh, one matter propagator which give me just one over Q. So overall, this is Q to the fourth over Q to the fifth. So this is uh, of order one over Q. And if you consider um, the um, classical, the G expansion on the potential, the order G squared thing you expect is of order one over Q. That means that this diagram is relevant uh, for classical physics. So we can do a similar thing by counting this uh, one do diagram, the box diagram. So it's almost the same as the triangle, except that now I have one additional matter propagator. Remember that the matter propagator has one of a Q scaling. So this one, if we use the result we just have for the triangle, gives me uh, one over Q squared. So recall that the uh, classical expansion um, or quantum effect is given by order Q over M. But now we can see that this box diagram, even though um, it's um, at order G square, is still of the same one over Q square as the tree level exchange. So this is sometimes, that's why we call this um, super classical. But maybe a better name is just to call this um, iteration. Because if you recall the partial function we have, e to i s, if uh, s is given by this uh, exchange, then when you spend this um, partial function, then you will get diagram like this. And that's why it's called iteration. And uh, you can compare a diagram, for example, like um, the bubble diagram. And uh, the bubble diagram uh, is the opposite from the box that um, compared to a triangle that we lose um, another order Q. So this is really of order one. But now given this uh, classical uh, scaling, we need things at least of order one by Q. So that means this diagram is um, being suppressed by quantum effect, which makes sense because um, this is really a self-energy diagram for the graphton, and this corresponds to the quantum running of the G Newton, which we not just here in this uh, classical setup. Okay, so I see I'm gonna conclude my lecture today. So yeah, any questions? You guys understand everything? Just very exhausted off of four lectures, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And probably also a Zoom chaos. Uh, can I ask something? Uh, yes, please. I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Yes. Um, nice. Go back uh, where you. Yeah. Uh, Okay, can you go yes. back to the matching of coefficients? This one. Um, um, this yes. 
So, yes. So can you explain a bit more how are you obtaining the the uh, uh, the term corresponding to the full theory? Ah, this one. Is that what you're asking? Yes, exactly. Can you explain? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, can, yeah. Can so you... I only call this as a result. Uh, it's actually one of the exercises from yesterday. But yeah, I'm, of course, I can explain. And in this case, it's really simple. So it both sound, okay, how do you do this uh, tree level calculation for gravity? And we can use the fact that we, because we're only interested in one of the t coefficient, so it's really given by just um, multiplying these um, three point amplitudes. And uh, each three point amplitude for this one, for example, P1, P2, is given by P1 dot epsilon square. The epsilon is the E is the polarization of the graph down, and this one is P2 dot epsilon square. So if you glue these together, okay, so that's why first you can see why this is so bolded M1 square, M2 square, is because this P1 square, P2 square give you this uh, scale. And uh, this structure, two sigma square minus one, um, you can work it out by using the projector that I described um, in um, the battery estate. So this is the graph from projector. So if you solve together with some, then you will get this um, two sigma square minus one structure. And depending whether you include the data or not in this projector, uh, you will have this minus one or not if you have um, the data in the intermediate state. Thank you. So, uh, so for the effective amplitude, you just say like, okay, I have an expansion over some parameter and I have some Wilson coefficients. And then you compute uh, to all orders using amplitude, your full theory, and then you just, uh, I mean, match all the coefficients. You get all uh, the coefficients from your effective theory from all uh, the amplitude computation. Yes. That's why M2s are useful. Yes, many things. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. so, uh, when you do the, the matching, uh, you match the um, effective field theory amplitude to the non-relativistically normalized full theory amplitude. Um, but yeah. you're deriving a fully relativistic potential. So why do you include the non-relativistic normalization? Um, it just a normalization, if you wish. Um, I can fix that, for example, if I'm willing to add, you know, my square root to E here. Well, it's probably not so convenient, but it's just a normalization. So it's just, you know, how the two one particles say are different. But um, I actually don't like so much the term of um, relativistic potential because we're doing something very sneaky here, which is, the particle we still restrict to potential. So there's something non-relativistic about it. If it's really like relativistic, then you can't really describe this using potential, as you know. You, the radiation really come in together with some potential if it's actually relativistic. Makes sense, thanks. Okay, there are no more questions. Then maybe can, can I ask? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so when we were uh, doing this toy example with the linearized uh, dilaton, and right. uh, we compute the effective action, mm -hmm. so there there will be terms uh, um, in which the current is evaluated in the same point. Are That's those a question. Yes. Yes, indeed. So I think you're asking. No, this J really, okay, so we only consider this case, 
we are at particle one and two, where you're asking what if things like this, say come from particle two and two, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. So um, there are two answers. One is that in general, this one, if you include them, then um, this behaves like a randomization on your uh, original word line action. So if you get some result here, then you have to add the counter term to your um, original word line action, and that will renormalize the mass, for example. And uh, for the case we consider in particular for this uh, potential region, this um, momentum K um, is really sensitive to the, in, um, the relative distance of the two particle. But in this diagram, it actually doesn't know about, um, for example, this X1 minus X2 doesn't have the relative scale R. So when you do the integration, this becomes scaleless. And in this um, potential region, this diagram actually becomes zero. So it doesn't renormalize your mass. So there are really two answers to, to that question. I see, I see. Thank you. Okay. Well then let's um, thank Jashen for this nice lecture and also thank all um, thank you to all the other lectures for today. Um.